We welcome everyone to this special Monday Thursday service here at First Presbyterian Church. We're so glad that you're with us and joining us at this important table tonight. Monday is a word that means command. And tonight at the table, Jesus will command his disciples and all of us to continue to remember him as we participate in the sacrament of bread and cup that we call communion, the Last Supper, or Eucharist. Tonight is a little bit different since you are there and we are here through this COVID-19 season that we are in. But we also have been given special permission by our denomination to enable us to have a spiritual communion tonight. So that means that in the service when we get to what would normally be communion, Connie and I will still break the bread. We will say the words of institution. But instead of you taking a piece of the bread or drinking from the cup, we will offer it to you and then we have some words on the screen that you will say in order to receive the bread and then receive the cup. So it is a little bit different, but we are bound by God's Holy Spirit. And at this table, Christ joins us all together. So let us worship God. Jesus was always the guest. In the homes of Peter and Jairus, Martha and Mary, Joanna and Susanna, he was always the guest. At the meal tables of the wealthy, where he pled the case of the poor, he was always the guest. Upsetting polite company, befriending isolated people, welcoming the stranger, he was always the guest. But here, at this table, he is the host. Those who wish to serve him must first be served by him. Those who would wash his feet must first let him make them clean. For this is the table where God intends us to be nourished. This is the time when Christ can make us new. So come, you who hunger and thirst for deeper faith, for a better life, for a fairer world. Jesus Christ, who has sat at our tables, now invites us to be guests at his. Please join me in prayer. Lord God, we are grateful for this time together, for this meal that you have prepared for all of us. Help us to know that it is a table of love, a table of hope, a table of light amidst so much darkness in our world. We would ask that in this service, you would open our hearts and minds and let your Holy Spirit renew us, refresh us, and revive us. That as we come together, we will be your people and you will be our God in this life and the next. In Christ's name we pray, amen.
Our first reading will be from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 14, verses 1 through 11. Listen now for the word of the Lord. It was two days before the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread. The chief priests and the scribes were looking for a way to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. For they said, not during the festival, or there may be a riot among the people. While he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very costly ointment of nard, and she broke open the jar and poured the ointment on his head. But some were there who said to one another in anger, why was the ointment wasted in this way? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and the money given to the poor. And they scolded her. But Jesus said, Let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has performed a good service for me. For you always have the poor with you, and you can show kindness to them whenever you wish. But you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for its burial. Truly I tell you, wherever the good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went to the chief priests in order to betray him to them. When they heard it, they were greatly pleased and promised to give him money. So he began to look for an opportunity to betray him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Our second reading is from the Gospel of Luke. We are in chapter 22, verses 7 through 23. Listen again for the word of the Lord. Then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover meal for us, that we may eat it. They asked him, Where do you want us to make preparations for it? Listen, he said to them. When you have entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house he enters, and say to the owner of the house, The teacher asks you, Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs already furnished. Make preparations for us there. So they went and found everything as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover meal. When the hour came, he took his place at the table and the apostles with him. He said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover meal with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup and after giving thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Then he took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he did the same with the cup after supper, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But see, the one who betrays me is with me, and his hand is on the table. For the Son of Man is going as it has been determined, but woe to that one whom he is betrayed. Then they began to ask one another, which of them could be who would do this? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. So we have these two passages. You have the Mark passage that talks about the woman who meets with them at Simon the leper's house in Bethany, who uses a full year's wages to anoint Jesus' feet. 
Now, we're not told in this gospel the name of the woman. It could be Mary of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. But in Mark's gospel, she is unnamed. She takes what she has and she gives everything to Jesus, not unlike the widow's mite who gives what she has just a few chapters earlier in Mark chapter 12. The disciples and Judas are in an uproar because what she has done to Jesus in their eyes has spent a ton of money that could have been used to help feed and support the poor. And like the disciples, and like we often do, they're missing the point of the moment. This woman is giving everything that she has to Christ. She is preparing Him for His death, for anointing His body, for what will come on the road to the cross. They don't understand. And Jesus has shared several times with them, but they don't get it, but this woman does. She gives all that she has so that Jesus can be properly anointed, adored, and prepared. They continue to miss the sanctity and the sacredness of this moment. And that's often what we miss as well. So often God speaks to us in the tender and amazing moments of our lives, and we dismiss it as we chase a rabbit trail, or we refuse to let in the power of the moment. Jesus tells them that this is important. She is doing the right thing by caring for me, for I will not be here much longer. And then we move to the upper room with Jesus and his disciples. They had gathered for the Passover feast. This was the Jewish celebration and retelling of the 10th plague of Pharaoh when they were enslaved in Egypt and God and Moses were working together to free them. And Pharaoh continued to say, no, I will not let them go. No, 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 until the firstborn, the 10th plague, the death of the firstborn. And God told Moses to tell his people to put blood on the door post of their home and the angel of death would pass over that house and not claim the firstborn of that house. So that blood of that lamb at the Passover meant life to God's people. And in the same way at this meal, as they have gathered to tell the story through the eating of ritual foods that we now refer to as a Seder meal, instead of grabbing the matzah, and breaking that, Jesus grabbed this bread and said, this is my body broken for you. And changed the whole understanding of why they were there to tell the story of bondage into new life. Although that message is there as well. Christ tells them that he will be soon to sacrifice and that they should remember him through his body and through his blood the sacrifice, the love, the grace that Christ will give His very self on the cross in this most painful and horrific manner so that you and me and this whole world would know His love and His grace. And so they shared this meal together. At a table like this with candles, with bread, with fruit just like we do tonight. And we remember the gift that Christ continues to give us through this meal. That that love for all of us, that our joining together, even though we are not in the same room, we are joined together at this table. The saints of all time whom we have loved join us along with the presence of Jesus Christ himself who sets this table for the world. What a gift that is. That whenever we have this meal, that it is that same meal that Christ set for us so many years ago. So as we practice and observe this meal tonight, take yourself back to that first occurrence of this. The disciples' startling 
understanding and Jesus' words of how this would play out, how his body and blood were about to be broken and shed for you and for all of us. And let us give thanks to the God who loves us and calls us home in this life and the next. Amen. And now we invite all of you, wherever you are, to join us for a spiritual celebration of the Lord's table, trusting that the Spirit is with us all as we gather in Christ's name. Please join me in prayer. Lord God, as we come to this table that you have set for us tonight, we know the sanctity, we know the sacredness of this meal, and we thank you. For it is at this table that we remember and we give thanks for all of the ways that you have loved us throughout the relationship of God and human beings. We remember how in our creation journey that God created the world and all of us as a part of that as human beings. And how throughout the Hebrew Bible, you loved all of us. And as we continued to turn away and break our promises, you kept your promises and continued to send others to us so that we may be brought home. Whether that is prophet, priests, kings, men, women, judges. There are so many whom you have sent to give us a way home until finally you sent Christ as the last sacrifice, the final way home, that when we come to Him and believe in Him, that we will be forgiven, that we will be granted new life, and that you will continue to be our God and we your people. We remember and we celebrate the ways that Christ was born into this world just a few months ago. How He grew, how He was baptized and commanded us to be the same. How He taught, how He healed, how He loved, how He reached out to the margins. And then how He finally gave Himself on the cross as the sacrifice for the world. But that wasn't the end. He was raised on the third day. Only you can do that, great God. And because He was raised, so too will we be raised to new life when we follow, believe, and claim Him as our Savior. So as we enter this meal, we would ask that you help us to feel your spirit, your sense of peace within us, a connectedness with you, great God, and with one another, all that celebrate this sacrament and meal tonight. For it is in your great name that we pray. Amen. So it is that when Jesus was with his disciples at that first meal, at a table similar to this, he took the bread that was before him, and after giving thanks, he broke it. He said, this is my body, broken for you. Every time you eat of it, do so in remembrance of me. In the same way, Jesus took the cup. And he said, this is the cup of the new covenant, sealed in my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of sin. Every time we eat this bread, and every time we drink this cup, we proclaim the saving death of Christ until he comes again. These, these are, are the, the gifts, gifts of God, God for, for the, the people, people of God. God. The body of Christ broken for you. I, I receive this gift in gratitude, gratitude faith, faith, and, and love. love. The blood of Christ shed for you. I receive this gift in gratitude, faith, and love. Thanks be to God. And now, reading from John's Gospel, 
chapter 13. Now before the festival of Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it in the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand and that he had come from God and that he was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. And then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and wipe them with the towel that was around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, you are not going to wash my feet. And Jesus answered, you do not know what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said, you will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no share in me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, one who has bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him, and for this reason he said, Not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, he put on his robe and had returned to the table, and he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you also should do as I have done for you. And then John's Gospel goes on to tell us about Judas and how he left the meal at that time intent on betraying Jesus. And after Judas' departure, Jesus says to the remaining disciples, little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, and so I now say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Here we have Jesus in one of his last gatherings with his closest friends. Judas has betrayed. Soon Peter will deny. Yet, Jesus loves them nonetheless, no matter what. And Jesus loves them not just with words. He doesn't just say, I love you so much. Words are really important. But what he does for them is he enacts love. He picks up the basin, and he picks up the towel, and he gets down on his knees in the posture of a slave and does what only a slave will do. He washes their feet. This is how Jesus demonstrates his love for his disciples in this poignant moment. And then he gives them the great commandment. Love one another as I have loved you. This is how other people are going to know that you belong to me if you love one another. So 
I want you to think about that great commandment that we love one another and what that might look like in this time of turmoil, of social distancing, of great uncertainty. How is it that the Lord would have you love others? And then there's another question that's inherent in this text, and it is, will you allow the Lord to wash your feet, to make you clean through the sacrifice he makes for you and for me and for all the people of the world on the cross at Calvary? These are the questions that stem from this great commandment and the greatest act of love, which is Christ crucified for us and for our salvation. Thanks be to God for his goodness to us. So the last thing in our service tonight is a ritual we call the stripping of the church. After Jesus was with his disciples at this meal, and they completed that meal, they then moved and left to go to the Garden of Gethsemane, 
where Jesus will be betrayed, arrested, and start the events that will lead through Good Friday to the cross, his crucifixion, and his death. And so the stripping of the church means that we are taking away everything that is ornamental, that is um, the normal way that we worship. So we will place black cloth over the pulpit, the communion table, and the baptismal font to signify this journey to the cross as we are almost there for Good Friday. So we invite you to join us tomorrow night for our Good Friday service where we will begin this transition. So God's blessing on all of us as we seek to walk with Christ to the cross.